May grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God, the Father, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Word of God, which is the basis of the sermon on this Easter Sunday, is a portion of the epistle lesson read a moment ago from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 13, where we read the last two verses of that epistle lesson. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. So far the text. The name of Jesus, who has put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, their fellow redeemed sinners and creatures of the one true only living, creating, and preserving triune God. There's a disease around. Have you heard? This disease, they say, has spread over the whole world. And it's caused a whole lot of trouble throughout the whole world. A whole lot of difficulties for the world caused by this disease. Now maybe you haven't got this disease. But even if you don't have it, this disease has still affected you because it's caused trouble in your life. And it's caused confusion in your mind, disillusionment. The Bible says, there's another disease. There's a disease in your soul. And this disease that the Bible speaks of has affected the whole world too. In fact, it is the cause of all the troubles in the world. It is the cause of all the other diseases in the world. And this disease the Bible talks about has caused all kinds of difficulties in the world. In fact, it's caused all the difficulties in the world. In fact, it's infected everybody in the world, everybody's soul, and it has caused all the troubles in every person's life. And all the confusion and all the disillusionments and all their difficulties caused by the disease the Bible says has infected all of our souls. It's an ugly word. It's a word we don't like to use. It's sin. Because we have pride. We have pride and we don't want to confess that we're wrong. We don't want to admit that we've not lived up to God and His laws and His expectations. We don't like to admit that. Because that's what sin is. This disease of sin means we have not kept the laws of God, our Creator. We've broken His laws. Are you willing to admit you're a sinner? You just did a moment ago in this worship service. And if you're willing to take that first step, 
to admit you've got the disease of sin in your soul. Then I ask you a second question. Is the forgiveness of sins your first and greatest need? Is it essential that you be cured? This text before us talks about the forgiveness of sins, the cure for the disease, that God will forgive all your sins. Take away the disease. Are you willing to also admit that is your greatest need? That is essential to you. You know, this word essential has also been floated around a lot in the last few weeks. What is essential? Grocery stores, essential. Other stores, essential. Gas stations, essential. Hospitals, essential. Government, essential. What is really essential to you? Is the one thing that's essential the forgiveness of your sins, the healing of your disease? That's what this text is all about. If you're willing to take that second step and admit that your first and greatest and most essential need what is necessary above all things is the forgiveness of your sins. Then this text applies to you. If not, this text doesn't apply. In fact, the whole Bible doesn't apply because you don't see your need for it. To you, other things are more important. To you, other things are more essential. Other things are more necessary. You know, you take a child. You ever taken a child into a toy store? A little child. What do they do? Or oh, they run around, oh, I need this. Oh, I need that. Oh, I need that. I need this. I need that. Oh, I need it all. They need it all. Every toy, they just, they just got to have it. And yet... The truth is, they don't need any toys at all. The fact is, there are only a few things we need. And the greatest of our needs is the forgiveness of sin before God. Now, when we die, and on the day of judgment, our greatest need is the forgiveness of sin before God. Now, this text lays before us two doors. First door, forgiveness of sins. The other door is the Ten Commandments, the Law of Moses. Let's talk about uh, the Law of Moses. There at the end of verse 39. One of the doors that people think that they can uh, go through and receive in that door the forgiveness of their sins. In fact, I would say that the vast majority of the world's population has believed and does believe that they can go through that door, the law, and there they can earn the forgiveness of their sins. They can cure their disease, this sin disease of their soul. By the law of Moses, they think they can obey the law of God and thus earn the forgiveness of their sins. The problem is, the Bible says they can't. It says it right here, ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. 
Can't be done. You cannot do it. There is no cure there. You will still be sin sick if you try that door. For the law only shows that you have broken it and that you have sinned. It shows you your sin. And the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, meaning short of the law of God, short of obeying the, God, the law of God perfectly. The Bible says also elsewhere, no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. The Bible also says, as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. There was an old pastor once who got up into the pulpit and preached this to his congregation. He said, if all I ever did was taught you the Ten Commandments, the Law of Moses. The Ten Commandments. That's all I ever did. And then I took these Ten Commandments and I applied them to your life. And every week I would tell you how to apply these commandments to your life so that you would go out and live according to these commandments every week. If that's all I ever preached to you, I might as well preach to you to go home and heat your oven with snowballs. You would be as prepared to meet God when you die or day of judgment, whatever. You would be, I would prepare you as much to meet God when you walked up to the gate of heaven as to put an icicle in your pocket. I might as well put a millstone, a 200-pound millstone around your neck and teach you to swim. Can't be done. Ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. I know that's what most churches preach. Most religions preach. In fact, every religion except the Bible religion preaches that. And all they hear when they go to church or whatever you call it, all they hear is, here's what God expects of you, now go and do it. Might as well put a millstone around their neck and try to teach them to swim. There's a second door. There's a second door to the forgiveness of sins. And it's in verse 38. And it says, Through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins is through this man. And the man that he's referring to, and he is only referring to, is none other than Jesus, the Christ, God the Son, also become a true man. Through this man, you will have the cure of your sin disease, but only through this man. Now this man, Jesus, is God who came to this earth and became a true man, born of the Virgin, not just to teach you how to live, not just to teach you some morality. He came primarily to offer himself a sacrifice for your sin. Now, if you had the, uh, the whole... Uh, Chapter 13 of Acts before you, you could refer back, but I'll help you with this. In verse 23, it says, Of this man's seed, and not referring to 
to Jesus there, but to David, King David, of this man's seed, and that turns out to be Jesus, a descendant of David, of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. A Savior. He came to be our Savior, not our moral instructor, primarily. He did teach the law of God, but he said you can't keep it. He came to fulfill it. He kept it perfectly and then sacrificed his perfect life, his life of both God and man, on the cross to heal our sin sickness. The Bible says it this way, and I don't know how you can say it any clearer, quote, your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake, unquote. Now that's a promise. That's a door you can go through and receive your most essential necessity, the forgiveness of your sins. Now, when you die or the judgment day comes or you appear before God at the gates of heaven in connection with this man, Jesus, then you will be justified. You will be justified. But you could not be justified by the law of Moses. You want to go through that door you will not be justified before the gates of heaven. This man, through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Through this man, this man who was crucified, a man who was crucified in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, can do for you what the law of Moses could never do, make you perfect in God's sight. Jesus, this man, can do for you what you could never do for yourself. Through this man, your sin is so forgiven, it is as though in God's sight you had never sinned at all. You had never sinned in the slightest degree. You had never sinned in anything you'd ever done, God will look upon you and say, you've never sinned. You've never broken my law. You've never even said anything against my law. You've never even thought anything against my law through this man. Now, if that doesn't make you feel good, I have nothing else. I don't know what could especially if you truly know what sin is. The Bible says of this man, he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, there's one other thing that this text adds. It adds the words, all that believe are justified from all things. All that believe are justified from all things. All your sins are justified through this man. By being connected to this man. How do you connect to this man? By believing. By believing this. By believing the Bible. This man is the center of the Bible. You believe in this man. What the Bible says about this man. By believing in him, you are connected to him. You are connected with him in the sight of God. And you are sinless because of that. You are justified. Believing. By him, all that believe are justified from all things. It's putting all of your trust in Jesus alone, completely, 
you think and you believe and you're willing to stake your life on this fact, his death is payment for all my sins. I risk all eternity on that fact. I believe. By him all that believe are justified from all things. The Bible says, Whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Unquote. It also says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. God deals with us individually, one at a time. We are all individuals to God. Individuals. It doesn't matter what somebody else believes. It matters what you believe. That's what God looks at. What does this person believe? What does that person believe? He looks at you as an individual. Do you believe in him, in this man? It doesn't matter what other people say. All that matters is, do you believe in this man? The overriding issue is, do you believe? The Bible says, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his Name, meaning Jesus, of course. Again, the Bible says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Note that repentance is an integral part of this believing. Repentance means that after a man is forgiven all his sins through faith in Jesus, then he now is a new creature, and he loves now what he used to hate. He loves now to do the works of the law of Moses, not because he thinks it'll earn him heaven, but because he loves Jesus, his Savior. And these are Jesus' laws, God's laws. It's God's will for us. And now we love to do the works of the law of Moses out of thankfulness to our Savior. The Bible says, you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Two doors, the law of Moses and believing in this man, Jesus. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Well, the Apostle Paul is preaching this, even as he says those words, he is preaching. He's preaching it to a group of people. He's laying these two doors before them. What was the uh, response? What was the result of this sermon of Paul's, the Apostle? What was the result of this preaching of the one door to the forgiveness of sins. Well, I'm going to read the result to you. It begins in verse 45. You don't have to have your Bibles open unless you want to, but I'm going to read to you what happened after he preached this man to them. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles." For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. 
And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life, believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. Some believed on this man Jesus, but it appears that most rejected him. Now this is Easter, and before I conclude this sermon, I want to talk a moment about eternal life and resurrection of the dead. Because this is not only the main theme of the day, but it is so denied today by so many people. Uh, let's call them atheists. And I, I have a little article here that I just found, and I think it sums it up pretty well. Uh, here's a particular atheist that is being quoted. He honestly admits uh, he's an atheist. And here's what he said. You are born, you live, then you die. If you don't think so, then you should. We come from an eternity of oblivion. We return to an eternity of oblivion. This is a distinguished professor, by the way, it says here, at a college or university. He's 79 years old. He's written or edited more than 50 books. And he says, in the end, you know truly that it doesn't mean a thing. His whole life, he says, doesn't mean a thing. Now that's the view of the atheist. And he quotes the 1882 version of Tolstoy saying, we end up as stench and worms. This article uh, says he then quotes to another atheist in 1942, uh, who said, there is but one truly serious philosophical question, and that is suicide. Then quotes another atheist who says, I dine, I play a game of backgammon, I converse and am merry with my friends, and when after three or four hours amusement, I would return to these speculations, they appear so cold and strained and ridiculous that I cannot find in my heart to enter into them any further. He concludes, this is a bleak world indeed. Well, there you have it. If you're not a believer in this man, Jesus Christ, that's all you've got. And if you believe, rather, in the love of Moses, you can earn your way to heaven through that. All you've got is hell. It is only through this man who disproved everything these atheists said when he rose from the dead. Death is not the end. The end. If you believe in him, all that he promises you will come to pass. The forgiveness of sins, and you will be justified from all things. And you will live with him forever in heaven, in eternal bliss. But God also warns you, if you don't believe on this man, I hate to even think where you will be for eternity. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all of man's understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus.